Hey guys, Brian Castro from Better Chest Training, and in today's video, we're going to discuss uh, material versus initiative, and I'm going to show you a beautiful game to illustrate the concepts. Okay, in our discussion of uh, material versus initiative, um, I'm going to show you a game here uh, between Grandmaster Yasser Sirawan uh, and uh, former world champion Anatoly Karpov, uh, two of the uh, best players, I think, to ever have played the game. Um, and I'm going to be using some commentary and analysis from Yasser Sirawan's books, Winning Chess Brilliancies, uh, but uh, I'm going to be glossing over some of it because I want to focus on our theme for today. Uh, and I encourage you to maybe uh, take a look at this book, and I'll put a link in the notes. Okay, let's get started here. Uh, knight to f3, knight to f6, uh, c4. And uh, here we, it's an English opening, but there could be many transpositions, as we're going to see shortly. Uh, e6, knight to c3 d5, and then d4. Here we have our Queen's Gambit decline, which uh, we have discussed uh, and gone over several games in this opening, but it's a very, uh, uh, it's an old opening, and it's still being played today, which is why uh, we go over uh, quite a few of these games, and they're also very instructive. Okay, bishop to e7, bishop to g5, and then h6. Okay, white plays bishop to h4, black castles, Rook to c1. So far, so good. This is all fairly standard. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that uh, Yasser Sirwan goes into uh, quite a bit of detail in uh, the specific move order and trying to play this inner game with uh, Karpov, uh, knowing Karpov's tendencies to get to a specific position. So um, if you want to get a little more into that, we're not going to cover that in this video, but if you want to do that, I would encourage you to uh, check out his book. It's actually quite um, inspiring as well as instructive. But let's get back to the game here. Uh, b6, and the idea here is to both uh, give this light square bishop a place to go, as well as preparing a c5 pawn lever, which is black's main way, or one of black's main ways of attacking white center in this opening. Okay, white plays c takes d5, knight takes d5, and uh, knight takes d5, e takes d5. So um, here... Black is now throwing the take, so white takes back, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. And here we have kind of our standard position, or a standard position that's been reached many times in Grandmaster play. And we're going to see here, there's actually a couple moves here. Um, one of the main moves, and I think it's perhaps the most popular move, is e3. And the idea here is to bring the bishop here to d3, and maybe the queen here to c2. And then we've got play down the C file as well as this uh, battery here. Okay, and actually there's a famous game uh, by uh, with uh, Bobby Fischer from his World Championship match with Boris Spassky, which I'll probably uh, make a video separate of it here that, that is in this opening. However, uh, in the game, uh, Yasser Sirwan chooses a different move. He plays G3. And his idea here is to bring his bishop here eventually and put pressure down this diagonal instead. So even though um, the position is uh, slightly different, there's different ways to um, approach it. And determining which one is better is uh, often a matter of taste as well as what's in style at the moment among the top players. So um, just keep that in mind when you're choosing different openings. One, especially at this early stage of the game, one isn't necessarily objectively better than another. Okay. Rook to e8. And so here black is putting pressure down this half-open e-file, especially this e2 uh, pawn. Now, um, white is going to play a very uh, strong move here, but let me show you some of the natural moves that would get us into some trouble. So uh, white's objective here would be to get his king to safety, and one of the ways he could do that is playing bishop to g2, which obviously initiated with this g3 advance. But the problem here now is that bishop to a6, and now you've got two defenders of this e2 pawn and two attackers. And if we play e3, well... 
now um, it's a little awkward because black or white cannot castle because of this bishop here. And these squares, these light squares around the king are a little weak. So we can, um, at some point in the future, and we're talking about here long-term weakness, uh, black might be able to take advantage of that. Okay, if, going back to the game position, if instead white plays e3, well now again we have these, these light square weaknesses and then bishop to a6 um, trades off this bishop, which is the reason we played b3, which is the player bishop here. So uh, in preparation of that, or in anticipation of that, um, Sirwan played a very strong move here, rook to c3. And this was a novelty uh, at the time, and uh, Siron explains that uh, Victor Korchnoi, who actually uh, was helping him prepare for this game, and uh, again, he's again one of the strongest players as well, and at the time, and this is, uh, I guess I, I didn't note earlier, this, is, uh, this game itself is from a tournament in England in 1982. So, um, and at this time, uh, Karpov is actually the uh, world champion. So, uh, Korchnoi actually played Karpov in a couple world championship matches, and uh, although he lost them, he had a very good fight, and he's a very uh, strong player, and um, kind of wanted to help Sirwan get a little bit of revenge. I think it was uh, um, partly a personal thing for him as well, and we could go into that in another video. Okay, uh, but Rook to C3 was Korchnoi's idea, and uh, but looking at the database, basically uh, Sirwan is the only one who has used this move, so... Uh, Korshnoi prepared this specifically for uh, Yasser's use. Okay, rook to c3 is played. The idea here is that he can move this rook to e3 and kind of stifle this uh, pressure down the uh, e-file. Okay, well, black plays knight to a6. And uh, it's a very uh, deep move. Uh, on, the, on the strategic level, it, it prepares the c5 move, but as we'll see in a little bit, um, there's some deep uh, analysis and preparation that went into this move because of uh, the tactics that are going to come up next. Um, but in general, the idea here is that he's going to play c5, and then if we take back here with the pawn, then we have an option of taking back here with the knight, where the knight would be uh, uh, pretty well placed. Okay. So white plays queen to a4. And if you've seen some of my videos on the, with the Queen's Gambit or uh, some other videos, um, there's uh, Bobby Fischer, Capablanca, these world champions, they, they took advantage. And even though there isn't an immediate uh, win of material, putting this pressure on these squares here, uh, the light squares, is a theme whenever black plays this pawn to b6. So obviously there's a give and take but that's something that you should always be aware of when you're playing in these type of openings. Okay. C5. And here, black strikes in the center. But white has a tactical shot here. So what I want you to do is, uh, why don't you pause the video and see what it is. Okay, I hope you had a chance to uh, guess what you think white would play. And he plays rook to e3. So this wins a piece by force. Uh, however, the point here for our theme here is that um, black, in return for winning a piece, which we'll sh I'll show you in a second, has received the chance to counterattack in an, an initiative. So white had to account for this when he made the decision to take this piece. Now let me show you what happens here. Um, if So we see here that this queen and this rook via x-ray are attacking this rook here, So uh, as well as the queen here. Um, if the queen just moves out of the way, say with queen to d8, then um, black or white is going to win a piece here. Rook to e8 check. Okay, if he moves to, I'm sorry, if he moves here to f8, then rook takes e8, pins the queen. So the only move that white has is to block this rook. Okay, and he does that with bishop to e6. Now we can see, though, that this bishop was protecting the a6 knight. So now he's not. Queen to a, takes a6. Winning a knight. So white is now a piece ahead. However, uh, actually, and it says this in the book, um, that uh, uh, Yasser Sirwan was fairly confident in himself 
at this point, and he took a little walk around the thing, and then he noticed that one of um, one of Karpov's coaches uh, was kind of smiling, and he was thinking to himself, "Uh oh, what have I gotten myself into?" And as this game goes on, he'll realize that uh, Karpov have actually has actually prepared for this move, and this peace sacrifice was intentional. Uh, we'll see though whether or not it was actually a correct um, correct move here. Okay, C takes D4. Uh, this is the start of this uh, counterplay that I mentioned. Black wants to open up the lines of the position because uh, White's king is still in the center here. Okay, and it's going to take a couple moves to get out. So, um, and the other point here is that this queen on a6 is no longer, it's kind of offside for the moment. So that's kind of the crux behind uh, today's uh, video is understanding these themes of the material and initiative. Because normally when you make decisions, it's going to be, Kind of one of the other. You're either going to try to win material or some type of uh, get some type of advantage, what we'd call a static advantage, uh, maybe with pawn structure, or you're going to look for something what we call more dynamic or temporary, such as an attack or a counterplay or the initiative. And when you can get both at the same time, obviously it's it's a big advantage. But a lot of times, especially if you're not making any obvious mistakes, it's going to be a competition between one or the other. So okay, let's keep going here. Um, what uh, uh, now? Black has a threat here, and that is queen to b4 check. Okay, and so white plays rook to b3 to prevent that. Okay, and um, just want to note here. Uh, actually, you can look at this as um, a little bit of a tactical quiz. Uh, if we take here, knight takes d4. Uh, go ahead and pause it again and see you if you can find Black's reply. It should be fairly straightforward here if you are familiar with your basic tactics. Okay, I hope uh, you had a chance to look at it. And the answer here is queen takes b4, forking the king and the knight. And so if uh, rook to c3 to block, then queen takes d4. And uh, Black's going to have an edge here. Even though right now material's even, he just won back the piece that he had lost earlier. Uh, his queen is fairly um, aggressive. These rooks are looking to get onto these open files. And this bishop can move to, say, f5, or g4, and put some more pressure on as well. So Black would have an advantage here. Okay, let's go back to the game where White played rook to b3. Now black plays bishop to f5. And the idea here is to attack uh, this rook here on c2. And um, the problem is uh, that white uh, will, will can't really um, take advantage of this extra material, meaning he can't really hold on to onto this extra material. So... Um, I'll show you what he played in a second, but if he plays something like knight takes d4, okay, to cover the c2 square, uh, again, I want you to pause the video, and this one is a little more, um, well, check it out. I want you to try to figure out what black would play in this position, okay? Pause the video, and then uh, see what black would play. Okay, in this position, after knight takes d4, black... Uh, gets a big advantage with queen to c5. Okay, the threat here is queen to c1, uh, checkmate. For example, if white were to take this, queen to c1 is checkmate. And if we try to block, let's say with rook to c3, then again, black will just pick up this um, knight. Now, if white plays rook to d3, this is probably the the best move here, the trying move, um, giving back, offering to give back this material then after bishop takes and then um, queen takes, actually white is kind of uh, reconsolidating here because uh, uh, his queen is back in the game and he'd be a little bit, uh, um, has a little bit of an edge here because his his pieces are well placed, his knight's in a good position, and then he's going to get his king to safety. However, uh, just going back here, uh, queen to b4 check, instead of taking this, um, puts a lot of pressure on, okay? Uh, rook to d2 to block, and then rook a to c8, and here we could see 
uh, his pieces coming in here, and it will be difficult for um, White to defend. Uh, did a little analysis on this, and, and White can survive, but it's, it's as you can see and, and hopefully feel, it's a fairly uncomfortable position for him. Okay, um, let's go back to the game, though. We don't want to get too far off track. Uh, seeing all of this, uh, White plays bishop to g2. He wants to get his king to safety. He's got to take a couple steps here um, to do that still because of this pressure on the e2 pawn, but uh, he starts it off with bishop to g2. Uh, bishop to c2, and remember again, we cannot move this rook because of this queen to b4 check, okay? Um, so, and also a lot of the squares are covered. So knight takes d4. So this is one of our techniques here. When, when we've won material, but uh, black has gained a big initiative or an attack, one of the techniques we can use is to give back material, okay? And hopefully we do it in a way that still gives us an advantage, and that's what uh, Sirwan does here. Okay, bishop takes b3, and then knight takes b3. By the way, just notice that if a takes b3, not only are these uh, pawns um, a little wrecked, but uh, we have this fork again with queen to b4 check, okay? Uh, knight takes b3, and rook a to c8. So uh, white, or a uh, black, is bringing his pieces to the open file here, and we can see we have this pressure down here. And again, even though white's given back a little bit of material, he still has to get to safety. Okay, and how he does it is um, something now that is uh, very instructive. He plays bishop to f3. Okay, and this secures this advantage here. Uh, material is about even, but once white castle gets his king to safety, he can go about attacking black's weaknesses. So let me just kind of overview what happened in the game. So white won a, uh, a piece, and then black got a little bit of an initiative or counterplay from it. In order to kind of stifle that a little bit, White gave back some of that material to to uh, help him gain some time back in order to get his king to safety. But in the whole analysis of it, because these grandmasters, they study these openings very deeply, and they've seen these types of positions or maybe these very positions in their preparation, um, White, uh, through his preparation, sees that now he's got an advantage because you can see here, once the king is safe, uh, he's got a few weaknesses. He's got this d5 pawn, which cannot be protected. It's an isolated pawn. Can't be protected by its another pawn. Uh, he's also got this a7 pawn, which is um, going to be targeted by white as well. Black uh, plays rook to c2. He wants to grab this b2 pawn. However, white will uh, uh, show us that this rook becomes a little out of place uh, because of this decision. Okay, white castles. And this was a big relief for white now that his king is safe. Rook takes b2, and now rook to d1. White is targeting this d pawn. Okay, rook to d8, protecting the pawn. Now, if white goes ahead and takes this, rook takes d5, then rook takes d5, bishop takes d5, he can take this e2 pawn here. And even though, again, uh, material is about even, this d5 pawn was very weak, while this rook, uh, this e2 pawn was not. So basically, black kind of gains in that exchange because he gets rid of one of his weaknesses uh, without loss of material. And so uh, white avoided taking on d5. Let's go back to the game here. Instead, he plays knight to d4. Okay, what does this do? Uh, this knight now is in a great spot because it can't be attacked by uh, black on this side. Uh, it hops, it's threatening here, this knight fork on c6, and it's just got a lot of nice squares here. You know, it, it restricts the movement of this rook because uh, it can't go to some of these squares now, it can't go back to c2. So uh, this is just a nice position here. So one thing to remember here is that when your opponent has uh, permanent weaknesses or weaknesses that he can't get rid of uh, easily, um, you can just let the, those weaknesses sit there. It's kind of torture for them because uh, you can just grab that up at some point later in the game, and instead you can improve other aspects of your position like uh, Sirwan does here. Okay, rook to d7. Okay, he's avoiding getting his, um, his rook and his queen forked here, as well as adding some support to the a7 pawn. Knight to c6. Okay, so white is uh, attacking the queen as well as targeting a7. 
And uh, just some thoughts here. This book, Rook here on B2, uh, White, uh, Sirwan mentions in his commentary that, that now, at this point in the game, he's now looking at a lot of tactics involved with this hanging rook. So even though nothing's attacking it currently, there's a lot of calculation that goes into this. And so it's a good reminder for us that when we put our send our pieces out there, we have to watch out for any tactics um, if they're out of place, okay? Queen to e8. Uh, by the way, if queen to c5, we have queen to c8 check, forking the rook and the king. So queen to e8 instead. And now knight takes a7. Here we're winning a pawn. And um, the idea here is that if black were to try to win this knight because sometimes grabbing these these free pawns on the wing are dangerous as i've mentioned in my other videos if he tries to pin this knight here then um white has a nice counter here with rook to c1 okay attacking here and now we've got some potential ideas here let me give you some examples if queen takes a7 then rook to c8 check king to h7 Queen to d3 check. He can't go back. This king can't go back here to the 8th rank. So he has to block with g6. And then queen to d4 is threatening mate here. As well as this rook here. So this is some of the ideas, some of the tactics we're talking about with this hanging rook. Okay, uh, let's go back here. Um, in this position, after rook to c1, if we instead take with the rook... Then we have rook to c8 check, which is going to win material, okay? So uh, black avoided this, of course, with rook to c7. And here he's just trying to get this rook active, okay? He's just ignoring this. He gave up that pawn, okay? Uh, a4, okay? What's the idea here? Now black is trying to uh, increase his material advantage here and give an outlet for this knight. Here's the idea. Uh, let's say that um, black makes a move like uh, queen to e7 uh, just to try to attack this knight. This knight now can come back, and now black is threatening here to, to take here. Okay, He's threatening this rook, and he's threatening to take here. Um, so this is just one of the... This is the idea behind this a4. In a way... Um, Black is kind of offering up that that rook here, okay? Because now by playing his rook to c7, one of the things he did is he prevented that uh, rook to c1 idea that I mentioned. So now black actually does go in and win this piece. And this was actually planned by white. Uh, because now we have some more tactics. And this is actually the uh, kind of the finale here. So just one other thing to note here is that, uh, so you're seeing here that white's play is very positional very strategic, but it is supported by all of these, these really cool tactics. So uh, in your own play, um, you know, we study our tactics and that's essential for us. And I've, I've made many videos about the importance of studying tactics, uh, but uh, it's also part of the strategy. Strategy and tactics are intertwined. They're not two separate things. You know, you're not just a positional player who doesn't do tactics, or you're not just a tactical player who has no positional knowledge. Um, these grandmasters and masters, uh, they have um, a great knowledge of both strategy and tactics, and they combine them kind of back and forth or, or at the same time. Okay, getting back to the game here. Uh, Rook takes d5, okay? And this opens things up. Of course, we're, we have this uh, threatened uh, discovery here. And after queen takes a7, uh, the fireworks start here. Rook to d8, check. Okay. And king to h7. It's forced. And now queen to d3, check. Does this look familiar? These are some of the tactics that we looked at earlier. f5. Queen takes f5, check. And now g6. Now, here, there's a little bit of a, it's not really a, a trap per se, but it's, um, how, how can we be the most accurate as possible? If we play queen to e5 with the same idea here of checkmating on h8, then uh, black has some tactics that will, would kind of give him a little life. Uh, rook to c1 check, king to g2, and the idea here is that now we bring our queen here to g7.
Okay, the idea of playing that that check here uh, with the rook was to clear this line for the queen, and now we don't have a checkmate. Now uh, white is, um, I think, still winning in this in this game, but um, definitely black has something to play for. So let's see what white actually played in the game. Well, in this position, uh, Sirwan found the best move, which is queen to e6. Now threatening checkmate on g8. And now uh, that tactic that uh, I showed you in the last variation, um, rook to c1 check, king to g2, then queen to g7 no longer works because of rook to d7 uh, pinning the queen. And if we go back here, to after queen to e6, uh, black resigned. Okay, just to uh, sum up a few of the concepts we discussed today uh, with regard to material versus initiative. So when you win material, uh, you have to consider your opponent's initiative and counterplay, uh, especially um, when you're looking at, you know, an opponent might be sacrificing a pawn or something like that. So you need to be careful and need to look out for your opponent's threats. Uh, when you're winning material, you often have to tidy up your position afterward. At least, uh, you know, the there's often the, the piece that won the material might be out of place now. And so now you need to bring it back or put it in another position. And also you have to watch out for the safety of your king if you haven't already uh, castled and if he's not safe. Um, one of the methods that we saw in the game was you have to be willing and prepared to give back material uh, in order to stop your opponent's initiative. So that often means uh, sometimes you might need to sacrifice the exchange uh, to stop one of your opponent's attacking pieces. Or, like if we saw in the game, allow one of your uh, pieces to be uh, taken and so that you can um, you know, shut down your opponent's counterplay and uh, redevelop, or develop your other pieces and get your other pieces um, active. And then finally, uh, when you do that type of thing, when you trade back that material, um, try to do it in a, in a situation where you can gain other positional advantages. So don't just give back the material to give back material but uh, make your opponent weaken his position in order to get it back. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully with uh, this example, and we'll probably have more of these in the future, um, look for these opportunities, or at least um, be aware of these differences of, of what decisions you're making, material versus initiative. It's not always a dichotomous. Um, they're not always opposed to each other, but oftentimes um, you can either give up material, and gain an attack, like with a sacrifice, or you can um, be the one who uh, be ready to be on the, the defending end of that initiative if you win material. So I uh, hope you can apply these concepts to your games. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, Yasser Sirwan is one of my favorite uh, chess authors and chess commentators, and uh, be sure to check out some of his videos here on uh, YouTube as well. And uh, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing. Better Chess Training is about helping you to get better with chess, uh, sharing ideas, of games, uh, about uh, improvement, about your improving your thought process, as well as your performance at the chessboard. So if that's something that you're interested in, I hope to see you in a future video. Have a great day.